Hello students, this is Professor Gore and this is part two of the British Empire in America uh, recorded lecture. In this uh, recorded lecture we're going to be talking about uh, early imperial wars. Now this is going to be before the Seven Years War or the French Indian War, um, which is going to be the big one. It's a big turning point in colonial history that ends up uh, one of the stepping stones of the American Revolution. We're also going to be talking about the South Atlantic system and talking about the slave trade, one of the big, big, big developments in, um, in world history. And then also slave revolts that, that come from uh, putting people in bondage. So um, anyway, so between 1689 and 1815, Britain fought a series of incre increasingly intense wars with France. I mean, they fought um, several colonial wars and then, uh, then they fought against France after the French Revolution. They technically fought against France and the American Revolution before that. And then they fought against France with Napoleonic Wars. So Britain's government spent three quarters of its revenue on, on military and naval expenses. As the war spread to the North American mainland, they involved growing numbers of colonists and Native American warriors now armed with European guns. Now, one of the things Native Americans like to do is they like to play the European powers off against each other to get more goods or some way they can exploit the situation and get things for themselves. Um, and so when France later gets removed from Canada, that's going to be a problem, as we'll see when we get to Pontiac's Rebellion. And so the most significant battles in North America occurred during the War of Spanish Secession, what was also called Queen Anne's War, uh, which happened between 1702 and 1713. Uh, Britain fought Spain and France, and English settlers in the Carolinas attacked Spanish Florida. Now, there was actually one that started before that, Queen, Queen William's War. Uh, all these wars start in Europe, except for the War of Jenkins era starts in the Caribbean, until we get to the Seven Years' War, and that actually starts uh, in uh, present-day Pittsburgh area. Um, and so, but uh, it, the times it is fought is you would have France that would incite the Native Americans against um, the English uh, colonial settlers and people on the frontier are the ones that affected. Those that are in Boston or Philadelphia, New York are unharmed. Uh, Shenacti and, and Massachusetts, or upstate New York, was actually brutally attacked in 1690. Uh, pretty, pretty bad uh, event there. Queen Anne's War, also called the War of Spanish Session, started in Europe. It's much bigger than King William's War, at least for the colonies. Uh, Deerfield, Massachusetts, uh, was on the western Massachusetts frontier, was attacked. I had to read a book about that when I was in graduate school. Fascinating story about this young girl uh, taken captive at the age of six, ended up being raised as a Mohawk uh, Indian, ended up having a Mohawk husband. Her father, who lost his wife and a couple of his other children in that attack, spent the rest of his life trying to find her, and they're able to reunite later in life. And he has a relationship with her and her new Mohawk husband and their children and so forth. So it does have a happy ending, but uh, um, brutal time. Albany is also attacked, uh, which is the most, one of the most furthest north settlements in New York. And uh, uh, France ended up losing uh, Port Royal and Newfoundland, Nova Scotia. Later, um, settlers um, uh, near uh, on Acadia, the Seniors were going to be expelled, and they end up going to present-day New Orleans uh, in the Louisiana area, and they become uh, what we call now call Cajuns. Okay, so um, one of the things that that happens uh, as well with some of these conflicts is um, with the the Spanish. The Spanish also incite Indians such as the Creeks and Cherokees to fight against um, the English, and um, the Carolinas armed the the Creeks, whose fifteen thousand members farmed the fertile lands along the present day border of Georgia and Alabama. The joint uh, force, so the Creeks and the English, burnt down the town of St. Augustine, but failed to capture the nearby forts. Uh, the Creeks wanted to dominate nearby tribes. They were a very powerful warlike tribe. Uh, they wanted to defeat the pro-French Choctaws to the west and the Spanish allied Appalachians to the south. Beginning in 1704, a force of Creek and Yamasee warriors destroyed the remaining Franciscan missions in northern Florida, attacked the Spanish settlement of Pensacola, and captured about 1,000 Appalachians whom they sold to South Carolina slave traders for sale in the West Indies. Wow. Simultaneously, a Carolina-supplied Creek expedition attacked the Iroquois-speaking Tuscarora people of North Carolina, killing hundreds, execute 160 male captives, and sending 400 women and children to slavery. The, the surviving Tuscaroras were like, I'm getting out of here. They moved to New York and actually became the sixth tribe of the Iroquois Confederacy. Okay. Surprised there had been a movie made about that, to be honest. Uh, in 1715, the Creeks and Yamasees revolted once they were told to pay for their gun debt. 400 colonists were killed before the natives were overwhelmed, thanks to help from the Cherokees. With French aid, uh, Catholic Mohawk and Abenaki warriors took revenge 
on the Puritans. They destroyed English settlements in Maine and in 1704 attacked the western Massachusetts town of Deerfield. Um, so that, it was actually about Mohawk Indians attacking them in the book. Killed about 48 residents, including uh, the minister's uh, wife and one of his daughters. And a six-year-old was captured out of the 112 that were taken. And in response, New England militia attacked French settlements and in 1710 joined with the British naval forces to seize Port Royal uh, and French Acadia, which is Nova Scotia. And they ones that moved to New Orleans later. OK, so uh, that basically I, I took a, a class in, in grad school on um, the frontier in American history. And it is violent. It is harsh. Uh, it was a tough way to make a living back then, especially in the colonial times, because you could be attacked at any time. Um, so you always had to kind of be ready and on guard uh, and so forth. So uh, let's talk about the Iroquois policy of peace after their Beaver Wars that we talked about in a previous lecture. Since merchants did not want to disrupt the lucrative fur trade and the Iroquois became tired of war, the Iroquois conducted, concluded a peace treaty with France and its Indian allies. Simultaneously renewed the covenant chain, a series of military alliances with the English government in New York and various Indian peoples. For the next half century, the Iroquois exploited their strategic location between the English and the French by playing off against each other. And they made a lot of money from it, or at least made a lot of uh, tools and so forth and uh, created what was considered Native American wealth at that time. OK, and in the Treaty of Ultricht uh, in 1713, Britain obtained Newfoundland, uh, Acadia, which is Nova Scotia, and the Hudson Bay region of northern Canada from France, as well as access through Albany to the Western Indian trade. From Spain, Britain acquired the strategic fortress of Gibraltar at the entrance to the Mediterranean, a 30 year contract to supply slaves to Spanish America. These gains solidified Britain's commercial supremacy to try to one up the Dutch preserved the Protestant monarchy instituted in 1689 and brought peace to Eastern North, North America for a generation. Okay. As there are different pictures and actually the top rights, colonial reenactors. Okay. This is a picture I found. It was supposed to be the young girl that was taken from Deerfield. It's not accurate, but you know, get the idea. All right. Let's talk about the South Atlantic system. Okay. I cannot emphasize to you the importance of sugar, okay? Sugar was the, um, really the petroleum of the 16 and 1700s. It is the most viable cash crop in the uh, transatlantic trade. It was extremely wealthy. It was all the rage in Europe and other parts of the world. You, you would use it in tea. They use it in uh, uh, cocoa to, to make a chocolate drink, kind of like chocolate milk. Uh, except without the milk, but uh, it is it was extremely profitable. If you ever want to know why slavery grows in the Western Hemisphere, it is sugar, sugar, sugar. Okay. Uh, not only is it causing more diabetes today in our country and leading to cavities and so forth, it actually uh, is the, one of the biggest contributors to slavery. Okay. Now it's not the crop's fault that people imported slaves, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, and so the South Atlantic system consisted of, of groups here. You had the merchants um, who would um, purchase goods, uh, manufacture goods, sell them to Africa. And then they would, these slave traders would buy the, the slaves, bring them to the planters. And the planters would grow, uh, use the slaves that they purchased and would grow sugar and then sell them, sell that to the merchants who would then sell it throughout Europe. You also had investors, and so the, the, the sugar plantations were very expensive to operate, and so they had to have a lot of capital investment. You yeah, realize the Caribbean also has really bad hurricanes. Hurricanes could wipe you out, but they made so much money that it was worth the risk financially for them, okay? And so um, let's look at what they each had. So the merchants import the slaves. Investors provide the ships and loans to planters, and the planters provide the sugar, and then they would sell it to merchants, okay? Now, let's look at the slave trade itself, because that's a huge part of the South Atlantic system. You, you can't have the, the growth of the sugar crop because it's so labor intensive without the slavery system. OK, and so uh, and the for the 1500s, OK, through about 1650, the Portuguese dominated. OK, there's about 820,000 slaves were brought at that time. They controlled about 95 percent of that slave trade. And then for about 50 years, give or take, the Dutch dominated it. And then for about 100 years, the British dominated. In fact, they brought more slaves to the Americas than any other country of world history. Now, what's ironic, I don't know if it's ironic, but they had the pool of 180, is the British completely turned 
turn the other way in the 1800s, and they become the biggest prosecutors of the slave trade, and they actually helped end it uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and, and they're the main country that, that is responsible for that. And it's because of William Wilberforce uh, and the Clapham Circle in, in uh, Britain that convinced the British people that slavery was morally wrong. It's one of the great good guy stories of world history. If you ever want to read about William Wilberforce, there's a cool documentary called Amazing Grace because the song Amazing Grace was actually written by John Newton, who was a slave trader. And when he converted to Christianity, he, he wrote that song uh, about his past life. And he actually mentored William Wilberforce. And William Wilberforce spent his whole career in Parliament trying to end the slave trade. It, it does end in 1807. And then slavery is abolished in the entire British Empire about three or four days before his death. It's pretty cool. Okay. So uh, really, the, the, the biggest moneymaker for the British Empire initially is going to be the Caribbean. Sugar, sugar, sugar. But over time, the British colonies of North America are eventually going to surpass that because of all their raw materials, manufactured goods, and they grow so much. They produce so much food. So the, the, uh, uh, because sugar was so profitable, they didn't have time to grow food. So the, the British colonies of North America grew the food, and they would sell it um, to the sugar planters to feed their slaves and themselves. Okay. So this is what we call the triangular trade, um, and, and uh, also some, a lot of times called the, the Atlantic system. So what you would have is um, the West Indies would provide sugar. The British North American colonies would provide the raw materials. It would be timber, um, uh, rice, indigo, food, all that kind of stuff. S send the sugar and uh, those things to England. England would in turn make manufactured goods and send that back to uh, North American colonies and the West Indies to, uh, for them to purchase. And they would also send goods down to West Africa. West Africa uh, would purchase rum and guns, among other things. And then they would uh, send slaves to the Caribbean or the British North America uh, colonies or uh, Central and South America. OK, so th I have several maps here that kind of illustrate all these different goods that they're bringing. It helps you understand the triangular trade. Three parts of the world, the Americas, Europe and Africa. OK, that's the transatlantic trade route. OK, um, so like I mentioned, Jamaica was the wealthiest colony of the British by 1750. Um, because of sugar, sugar, and more sugar. Um, and so I can't emphasize the importance of sugar enough um, to help you understand that. And so uh, it does it does change this, and it becomes probably the most profitable trade route uh, in the world, even more so than the Indian Ocean. That's saying something. Now, uh, because of the demand for uh, lots of laborers for sugar, it leads to the rapid rise of slavery. And so you can see right here um, the percentage of where they go. Now, I've, I've told students for years, okay, the two worst places to ever go in world history if you were a slave in the transatlantic slave trade is the West Indies, which is the Caribbean, and Brazil because of the climate, and you're working on sugar. Now, the mines that you're going to in Central America or South America suck too. Uh, that's probably the second worst place to go. Now, the Guiana is also grew sugar, so that's kind of like Brazil. Um, and But British North America is actually the best place. Reason why uh, rice and tobacco are hard work, but they're not as hard as sugar or as dangerous as sugar, and yet a really, really high death toll in sugar. And they even had um, uh, these uh, machetes that was right by the pressing machines because oftentimes people would get their limbs stuck and have to cut their limb off right there in a machine. It, it was terrific. Um, and so that's one reason why uh, they're much more uh, – descendants of African slaves in British North America or modern day United States today. And there are in even Brazil and the Caribbean, even though there is a, still a large population there. And that's because the uh, life expectancy was much longer there. So, all right. Um, so about 11 to 12 million were, were uprooted. Uh, there were still uh, slaves being traded on the Trans-Saharan trade route and the Indian Ocean trade route. We'll talk about that a lot in world history. Um, it does lead to uh, a male and female imbalance, uh, but the population actually still stays stable because of the importation of potatoes from the Columbian Exchange. And so uh, we just led to polygamy where uh, one man married several women and so forth. Um, and it's the African kingdoms on the West Coast that kidnapped um, those uh, slaves and brought them to the coast. They would go inland and attack and so forth. Um, slaves, were, like I said, were sent to North Africa and uh, the Ottoman Empire and so forth, and, and uh, that were uh, Muslim controlled and so forth, and then even sent to the Indian Ocean. Uh, but this is one of the most inhumane aspects of world history. Slavery has always existed, uh, but because of the sugar um, 
Trey, it, it became even more brutal than it, it almost as brutal as it had been during the Roman times. Uh, in some ways, it was actually more brutal. And you can see the uh, the estimated numbers of where people originated from uh, that came from West Africa. So if you were in East Africa, you were unaffected by this. Okay. Now, the Middle Passage, I always tell students, is one of the top 10 worst places to be in world history. Um, they would pack in uh, slaves like sardines onto crowded ships, um, and they would intentionally overpack them, knowing that some are going to die along the voyage. And I try to keep them as healthy as possible. But you're down there with your own uh, sweat, uh, human waste, both uh, number one and number two, and uh, uh, people vomiting and so forth. Um, you also had people that had dysentery, where the bottom falls out of your world, the world falls out of your bottom. It is really uh, as bad as you can imagine. And we don't know how many actually fully died on the voyage because um, we have record books, but some of them are not always accurate. Some are. It just kind of depends. Uh, but they, anybody that resisted, uh, they would also chain them up um, so that way some couldn't just jump over and commit suicide. Of course, many did. We don't know how many slave revolts there were on the Atlantic. Uh, Amistad is a movie that I, I have my students watch that was depicted in the 1830s. To uh, <clears throat> that was a successful slave revolt on a Portuguese slave trading ship in the 1830s. And it's a, a really moving uh, movie done by Steven Spielberg. So um, scurvy was a common thing, dysentery, measles, smallpox, um, disease, and so forth. They wanted them as healthy as possible, but when you're taking them in those conditions, um, you can imagine what you're going to get. Uh, the labor conditions were horrible when they arrived, if you were going to sugar. Ten-hour days, hot, humid uh, climate. Uh, many of them are worked to death. It is it is as bad uh, as advertised in world history. Um, and so, we, you know, we oftentimes movies portray um, slavery in British North America. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of movies portray slavery in the Sugar Islands because it'd be very difficult uh, to watch and depict on screen or Brazil as well. Um, so uh, where they're going to in the American colonies or the Chesapeake colonies, uh, the Carolinas, not until Georgia until later, uh, mostly going on tobacco plantations and then rice in South Carolina. Okay. So that's the main crew they're going, uh, Virginia, Maryland, and South Carolina. <laughs>